intensified by the wounds dealt by my sharp arrows, were enjoyed by him. That my mind thus go unto Sri Krishna. Purport. The Lord is the absolute form of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. As such, transcendental loving service to the Lord in one of the five principal relations, namely Shanta, Dasha, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya, or neutrality, servitorship, fraternity, filial affection, and conjugal love, is graciously accepted by the Lord when offered to the Lord in genuine love and affection. Sri Bhishma Dev is a great devotee of the Lord in the relationship of servitorship, dasya. Thus, his throwing of sharp arrows at the transcendental body of the Lord is as good as the worship of another devotee who throws soft roses upon him. So there. Because all that he did was for the pleasure of Krishna, and when Krishna was enjoying being hit by the arrows and making wounds on his body. Now it's described by your acharyas, this is a, a transcendental exhibition of wounds. <laughs> because we know in Ishopanishad, one of the characteristics of the form of the Lord is, you know, stated one way is he's, it's all spiritual. Stated another way, he has no veins. So how can there be blood if he has no veins? Because it's a transcendental exhibition as if he has blood. Just like a transcendental exhibition of anything. As if he has a body like ours, but he has no body like ours. He has no body like ours. But it appears that he has a body like ours. So that he can engage in, in loving dealings with us. Paragraph. It appears that Bhishma Dev is repenting the actions he committed against the person of the Lord, but factually, the Lord's body was not at all pained due to his transcendental existence. His body is not matter. Both he himself and his body are complete spiritual identity. Spirit is never pierced, burned, dried, moistened, etc. Bhagavad Gita, right? This is vividly explained in the Bhagavad Gita. So also it is stated in the Skanda Purana. It is said there that spirit is always uncontaminated and indestructible. It cannot be distressed. Nor can it be dried up. When Lord Vishnu in his incarnation appears before us, he seems to be like one of the conditioned souls materially engaged just to bewilder the asuras or the non-believers who are always alert to kill the Lord even from the very beginning of his appearance. Kamsa wanted to kill Krishna and Ravana wanted to kill Ram because foolishly they were unaware of the fact that the Lord is never killed for the spirit is never annihilated. Paragraph, one sentence, paragraph. Therefore, Bhishma Dev's piercing the body of Lord Krishna is a sort of bewildering problem for the non-devotee atheist. But those who are devotees or liberated souls are not bewildered. I hope you're in the not bewildered category. Paragraph. Bhishma Dev appreciated the all merciful attitude of the Lord because he did not leave Arjuna alone. Although he was disturbed by the sharp arrows of Bhishma Dev, 
nor was he reluctant to come before Bhishma Dev's, Bhishma's deathbed, even though he was ill-treated by him on the battlefield. Bhishma's repentance and the Lord's merciful attitude are both unique in this picture. So, let's go over that again. There's a lot of contradiction here. One of the contradictions is Bhishma Deva's feeling repentant, but also Bhishma Deva's appreciating that Krishna is enjoying being hit by his arrows. There's a contradiction. And Krishna was enjoying being hit by his arrows. And Krishna wasn't feeling any pain. And, but Bhishma Dev was pained at feeling that he, he is my master and I'm shooting arrows at him. At the same time, so that's the, this is a science of rasa. The science of rasa teaches that there's, as mentioned in this purport so far, five primary rasas. What are the five primary rasas? Shanta, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, Madhurya. Neutrality, Shanta. Servitorship, Dasya. Friendship, Sakya. Parental affection, just, just let them, let them do it. Pay attention. We got too many commanders and generals in the audience here. And it's very distracting. I'll just sit here and stop until I, so you're all paying attention. I could just move the chair, that's what I'll do. Now you gotta move the camera. Five primary rasas, seven secondary rasas. We discussed this already twice. This is third time. What are secondary rasas anyways? Secondary rasas, I'm glad you asked the question. Secondary rasas are to enhance the primary rasa. As um, Rupa Goswami teaches, well, let's go back a little bit. Who long, long before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared gave the foundational science on rasa? Bharata Muni. You've all heard of Bharata Natyam dancing, right? It's named after him. Bharata Muni is a celebrated person who taught the science of rasa in a certain form and fashion. And based upon Bharata Muni's teachings, Rupa Goswami expanded those teachings in such a manner, based upon the, the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, to make the, the fullness of rasa. Because the, the dance form was meant to stimulate moods. All the mudras, all the everything and everything and everything was meant to, by expression of dance, cultured expression of dance and the music that accompanies the dance and the beats and the rhythms and the slow and the fast and the it's everything, it's everything, is meant to stimulate moods or, or feelings. Mellow. I'll put would translate as mellow or a feeling. Affection. Affect, the affective as, aspect of life through, through art and through literature, same. So Rupa Goswami took that and built upon it, expanded 
the number and the details. And then there's sub details of those details and sub details of those sub details. It's, you know, it's very, very involved, very involved to explain the science of Rasa. And it's all in Prabhupada's lecture devotion, especially the latter part portions, describing this Rasa mixes with that Rasa makes a third Rasa. It's kind of like cooking. Some of you like to cook. Some of you like to eat nice cooking. <laughs> Here's a little, little nice story. Some of you know of a Prabhupada disciple named Mother Jamuna, celebrated Kirtanir. You may you may not know. Um, she's the one that recorded Govindam Adipurusham Tamaham Bhajami. That record was recorded, composed, and recorded by George Harrison. One side was the Hare Krishna mantra. The other side was the Govinda song. It, it, it evolved from Jamuna being asked by George Harrison, if you want to become famous, I can make you famous. I know how to do it. He really liked her voice. And he said, I can make you famous. She said, let me think about it. Didn't take long. She got back to him and said, no, thanks. I don't want that lifestyle. I want a lifestyle of just singing from Krishna. He said, very well. Let's go to the Apple Record Studio. We'll make a recording. So that was the recording. Once it was it, in those days, it was 45 RPM, little plastic disc, and it was the best seller in Europe for the whole summer, throughout all of Europe. The Hare Krishna mantra, compliments of George Harrison and Apple Records, and the other side was the Govinda song. When Prabhupada heard the Govinda song. I wasn't there. I was told by those who were there. He began to cry. So beautiful. And said this should be played every morning when greeting the deities in our temples. And that's what has been the case since then. But she, So she had, she had a taste for kirtan, but she also had a taste for cooking. She told me a story. One time she went out of her way to get the best rice and had a certain name. She told me the name. I don't remember the name. And she prepared that best rice for Prabhupada. Prabhupada's taste was so refined. He took just a few grains of the rice, popped it in his mouth, savored the taste, and told her exactly what type of grain it was and where it came from. So she then shared that with another of our ISKCON youth named Janavi. Maybe some of you, at least our younger devotees, know who she is. And uh, Jamuna taught Janavi how to savor, not just like enjoy the taste, but appreciate the various ingredients within the food that's prepared very expertly and elegantly in quality. Taste this. Taste. So, and she was training her not only to cook, but the same for music. Because, it, it, you know, it, refined spiritual senses have the capacity, not just what the ingredients are, but the, this specifically back to Rupa Goswami, the stimulations of ecstatic love. Very refined. Now, most of us are not so refined. But by association with those that are refined, it can help us to become refined and appreciate things, to see things, to understand things that we otherwise wouldn't see or understand or appreciate. Like this, you know, this little passage, and, and it's a two-page purport, Prabhupada describing the science of Russia, what's going on. Very unique. Seemingly contradictory things. Bhishma Dev is appreciating exactly what he wanted to, de to demonstrate Krishna did, which was that Krishna would protect Arjuna. Krishna knew that there was no way that he could kill Arjuna with Krishna present. 
He did, so he wasn't interested in killing Arjuna. His grandfather, Bhishma, he trained him from, from childhood. He loves him. So why is he trying to kill Krishna? He's not trying to kill to Arjuna. He is trying to have Krishna display his quality of Bhaktivatsala. How, how much happiness that brings him. That Krishna is so kind. Even it means breaking his vow. Because Krishna had a vow. He wouldn't fight. But he picked up Arjuna's chariot wheel and came to smash Bhishma. I mean, it's really transcendental. And that's what his mind is absorbed in. He's about to leave his body and he's looking at that feature, the physical feature and the emotional feature of Krishna. And he knows that Krishna is enjoying doing this. He knows that he's helping Krishna get that happiness in doing this. That's his servitorship to Krishna. At the same time, he has a conflicting emotion of regret that, that he has to, had to fire arrows at Krishna and bring wounds. Knowing that Krishna is not feeling any, so it's feeling any pain because his body is all spiritual. I mean, the consciousness of a transcendentalist is out of sight, inconceivable, but yet our founder, Acharya Srila Prabhupada, is breaking it down into little... It's, it's like Jamuna tasting or Prabhupada tasting a certain kind of rice and understanding its quality just by the taste. Here we go. <clears throat> Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, the great Acharya and devotee, in the humor of conjugal love with the Lord, remarks very, very saliently in this regard. He says that the wounds created on the body of the Lord by the sharpened arrows of Bhishma Dev were as pleasing to the Lord as the biting of a fiancé who bites the Lord's body directed by a strong sense of sex desire. Such biting by the opposite sex is never taken as a sign of enmity even if there is a wound on the body. Therefore, the fighting as an exchange of transcendental pleasure between the Lord and his pure devotee, Sri Bhishma Dev, was not at all mundane. Besides that, since the Lord's body and the Lord are identical, there is no possibility of wounds in the absolute body. The apparent wounds caused by the sharpened arrows are misleading to the common man, but one who has a little absolute knowledge can understand the transcendental exchange in the chivalrous relation. That's the secondary rasa. Chivalry. To enhance the primary. Prabhupada would give the example. For example, sometimes kings would keep a wrestler. And... <clears throat> The wrestler was supposed to give a big tussle to the king because the king liked being tossed around by a powerful component and they would enjoy. But the purpose of the wrestler was not just to be, you know, a pansy. The wrestler was to give wax, really hit the king hard. But when he hit the king hard, the king didn't become insulted. It's another thing if it was a, another warrior king or something like that. But it was, it was it, the, the, the kings would enjoy that sporting conduct. And it was a service. The wrestler and companion of the king. The Lord was perfectly happy with the wounds caused by the sharpened arrows of Bhishma Dev. The word... Vidya mana is significant because the Lord's skin is not different from the Lord. No. Vividya mana. Because our skin is different from our soul, in our case, the word vividya mana, or being bruised or cut, would have been quite suitable. Transcendental bliss is of different varieties, and the variety of activities in the mundane world is but a perverted reflection of transcendental bliss. 
because everything in the mundane world is qualitatively mundane. It is full of inebriates, whereas in the absolute realm, because everything is of the same absolute nature, there are varieties of enjoyment without inebriety. The Lord enjoyed his wounds, created by his great devotee, Bhishma Dev. And because Bhishma Dev is a devotee in the chivalrous relation, he fixes up his mind on Krishna in that wounded condition. It's quite elevated, you know, to, to a material, materialist perplexing. I mean, there's extensive commentary in the passage where how Krishna leaves this world. Anyone here not know how Krishna departed this world? You all know. You don't know. You're not sure. Hello. I'll narrate. It's from the tenth canto Bhagavatam. Actually, from the later cantos. You know the the, the pastime prior to Krishna's departing this world, Uddhava knew. So Uddhava went to Krishna in Dwarka to inform Krishna, I know that you're going to leave. Please take me with you. And he was crying and sobbing. Because there's very dear, dear, dear devotee of Krishna. I won't be able to bear your separation. Before you depart, Krishna didn't say no, he didn't say yes. Before you depart, please give me elaborate teaching so I can hold you in my heart. So he, the whole Uddhava Gita section is described in that situation. Maitreya was there. Maitreya heard the whole conversation. Uddhava was then told, I have some service for you. What's that? The service is I entered into this world to give association to all my devotees but I didn't get to visit the devotees of Nara, Narayana Rishi in Badrinath. So please go there, carry the teachings that I just gave to you, to them, and that way I can give my association through you. Note, that's how Krishna gives his association to others. He was torn. He wanted to stay and be with Krishna, but Krishna's getting, he knows he's going to leave. And Krishna's given him some service and he wants to serve him. So he departs. It's now time to end Krishna's pastimes. So what did Krishna do? Just, just prior to this, a pastime was enacted by Krishna where uh, Narada Muni was visiting in Dwarka, and Vasudev, Krishna's father, took the opportunity to invite Narada to his home and honor him, a Chatriya honoring a great Brahmana, Vaishnav, and saying, I was so much absorbed in my life as Krishna's father, I, I didn't take the time to ask you about teaching me absolute truth. So can you please instruct me in absolute truth? The long section, Nard instructs Vasudev. Vasudev decides when all of that is over to hold a big yagya at his home or palace. And so he invites many, many brahmanas. They have a big yagya. He distributes gifts and everything to the brahmanas. They have a big feast. The brahmanas go to a nearby place to associate together and discuss transcendental topics. One of the sons of Krishna, named Samba, goes before the brahmanas who are assembled together at this slightly distant place and insults them. He insults them by spoofing 
by dressing as a, as a lady, having her head covered, but it was Samba, and a big belly. And the other boys were saying that this lady is shy. She wants you to tell them, will the child be a boy or a girl? But it wasn't a child. It was Samba dressed up. They knew, and they cursed that that lump of iron that's in the belly of the Samba will bring the destruction of the entire Yadu dynasty for this offense against the Brahmanas. They quickly went back and told Ugrasena what happened. Ugrasena consulted his ministers. The ministers said, take that lump of iron, grind it into powder, and throw it in the sea. So that's what was done. They ground it into powder and threw it in the sea. Except for one piece, except for one piece that wouldn't grind. So they threw that into the sea. That piece that wouldn't grind was swallowed by a fish. The fish was caught by a fisherman. When he opened up, when he sold the fish to a hunter, the hunter opened up the fish and found this piece of iron, and he used that piece of iron to fashion the head of an arrow, and it was the head of that arrow that hit the heel of Krishna. And Krishna departed the world from being hit in the heel by that hunter's arrow. Question, does anybody ever die by being hit in the heel? Answer, no. Question, then what was all that about? Answer, it was to bewilder the materialists because not only did Krishna depart this world by being hit in the heel by that hunter's arrow, but he left behind a material body. But Krishna has no material body. Correct. But to bewilder the atheists, he left behind a material body that looked like him. Why did he do that? To bewilder the atheists and to help the devotees who understand the transcendental nature of Krishna's activities, what he's doing. Because if you don't understand the transcendental nature of Krishna's activities, you get the wrong idea about anything and everything. If you know the verse, you can say the verse with me. Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tattvataha jaktva deham punar janma naiti mam eti sarjuna So it is the transcendental nature of his janma. But what about the transcendental nature of his departing this world? The transcendental nature of his departing this world is equal to his transcendental nature of his appearance. He appeared in the prison house of Kamsa in a four-armed adult form, and he departed the world being hit in the heel by an arrow, leaving behind a material body. And they're both as equally transcendental. To the materialist, it's just stories. They have no faith. And so whatever it is, prison house, forearms, leaving behind, you know, it's just, it's just a story. And so Krishna, Krishna is in the heart of everyone. And he, that means he's in the heart of bad people. He's in the heart of a thief. Where does the thief get intelligence? How to steal? From the same place that the house order gets intelligence, how to keep the thief away. <laughs> He's reciprocating with the desires of all living. There's consequences for bad desires. There's consequences for the hunter that hit Krishna in the heel with his arrow. He thought it was uh, uh, some animal in the forest and he's just shot the arrow, hit Krishna. So there's tra the, so how to understand the, the transcendental nature of Krishna's appearance and activities through devotion, 
And except through devotion, one will not understand. It's another verse of Bhagavad Gita. Bhaktyamam abhijanati yavanyasyasmi tattvataha if you with this through devotion alone. And so Bhagavatam is for devotees, and the commentary of Aracharyas gives a big assist to understand the transcendental nature of, of Krishna. Next verse, text 35, 1.9.35. Bhishma Dev speaking. In obedience to the command of his friend, Lord Sri Krishna entered the arena of the battlefield of Krukshetra between the soldiers of Arjuna and Duryodhana. And while there, he shortened the lifespans of the obsolete party by his merciful glance. This was done simply by his looking at the enemy. Let my mind be fixed upon that, Krishna. Powerful. Krishna's glance is very powerful. Krishna's glance is very powerful. Krishna's glance as Mahavishnu brings about the whole material creation. It's just his glance. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to lift a pinky. He doesn't have to, doesn't have to do anything. He, he can create. You know, to do for us to do anything, we have to. There's some endeavor. For Krishna, there's no endeavor. Just his glance. When Krishna was returning back to. Dwarka, after being in Hastinapur, he was traveling along with the whole entourage returning back to Dwarka after Yudhisthira was installed as the king, etc. And it's described the citizens came to greet him. They were so happy. And the, the ladies who were shy, they would stand on the rooftops, but they would their eyes absorbed in seeing Krishna and their hearts melting seeing Krishna and Krishna looked at them and just by his glance the Bhagavatam describes that they Krishna entered their eyes from their eyes to their hearts and in their hearts they embraced him and felt as satisfied as if they had embraced Krishna with their arms his eyes are very powerful. Of course, there are different versions of Ramayana, but it's one version of Ramayana says that Ram was able to boil the ocean just by his angry glance. In the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam, before the Rajasoya Yagya, there was a circumstance where uh, Krishna is it, it, seated at the royal assembly, the Sudharma assembly hall, along with the, the other Vrishni elders. And as he's seated there, two, two people come almost simultaneously. First, Narada comes. And Narada says, you, Yudhisthira, would like your presence. Please come at once to Hastinapur. He'd like to perform the, the Rajasuya Yagya, and he'd like your personal presence. Please come. Krishna loves the Pandavas. He's happy to come. While he's still in that Sudharma assembly, in comes another messenger, Brahmana. Because he's a Brahmana, he got entry. And he came right before everybody and it was delivering a message from 20,000 kings who were imprisoned by Jarasandha who was planning to make a human sacrifice to Mahabhairava of these 20,000 kings who were prisoners in his jail. And they were appealing to Krishna to rescue them. So now there's two requests. 
the request of 20,000 kings to protect us, and the request of Yudhisthira to come to attend the Rajasurya Yagya. So Krishna pretends that he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> so he asks Uddhava, what should I do? Uddhava knows that Krishna knows, but he takes the position in service to Krishna of being a minister. And he says, uh, according to culture, the Rajasurya should not be performed as long as there are some opposing kings who would object. Jarasand is an opposing king who would object. So he needs to be removed. And if you remove him, then simultaneously the kings will be freed. So you should remove him first and then go to the Rajasurya Yogya. But to remove Jarasandha, he's so powerful, un incredibly powerful. It has to be done in a one-to-one -one combat because with his military, he'll be victorious, whoever goes. The way to get him to agree to one-to-one -one combat is he has a very strong liking to say yes to brahmanas, whatever they want. The one that's capable of defeating him is Bhima. So Bhima should go in the guise of a brahmana and make the request as a brahmana for some wish and then ask him for combat in the one-to-one -one combat. And you have to be there. You have to be there because even Bhima can't defeat Jarasandha. But if you're there, Bhima will be able to defeat him. Same as what's being said here. Just by your glance, all the enemies on the opposite party were destroyed. Now, he didn't, you know, cast an evil eye or something like that. It's just their regard for him was like their, uh, their regard for the, core, the Pandavas. The enmity, here's a Mahabharata story. Before the Kurukshetra battle, I hope you like stories. Before the Kurukshetra battle, Yudhisthira was feeling very badly that we shouldn't have this battle. It's not good. Balaram was concurring. It's not good that the cousin brothers should not battle like this. What will be the consequences? And, you know, same, same things as chapter 1 Bhagavad Gita. So many bad consequences. Shouldn't do it. Krishna wanted the battle. Bhima wanted the battle. Really bad. So Krishna said, I'll go with a peace mission, knowing that they would deny. So the peace mission was, you let, you keep the kingdom, give just a small portion of the total kingdom to the Pandavas. They'll sub be subservient under you and then you can be the emperor of the world. That was the peace mission. So it was agreed upon. Krishna would try to make peace. And he went with ministers in an entourage. And he set up camp outside Hastinapur. This had happened earlier when Balaram came to make a peace mission. And it ended up differently. So Krishna came with a peace mission. And Duryodhana made a show of, of pomp in receiving Krishna very nicely. You know, it's a very, all the details of cut banana trees and rose water and flower petals and a long, 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 long thing to honor big arches in the entrance of the, to the city. And he went out personally to greet Krishna, welcoming him. So wonderful that you've come. Whatever is your mission, whatever you want, just say it. Please uh, take meal at my home. Krishna replied, A man may take a meal for one of two reasons. One, he's hungry. The other is, even if not hungry, when there's love, he may eat and take a meal. I'm not hungry. And here in Hastinapur, there's no love. You have no love for me. 
proven by the fact that you have animosity towards the Pandavas. If you have animosity towards the Pandavas, it's animosity towards me. That in fact, for that matter, there's no one in the whole of Hastinapur that's fit for me to eat at their home except one person. Vidura. I'm going to the home of Vidura and I'll take my meal there. Very strong. It, you know, so Krishna, Krishna knows, and according to the disposition of anyone, their regard for Krishna, Krishna reciprocates. What's the Bhagavad Gita verse where Krishna says that? Yeyatamam prapatyante tangstadaiva pajamyaham mamavartmanu vartante According to one's prapadyante, according to as one surrenders unto Krishna, he reciprocates accordingly. So Bhishma Dev is recognizing just by Krishna's glancing over the enemy soldiers, I mean, they didn't, he didn't have enmity towards them. They had enmity towards the Pandavas, which means they had enmity towards him. And their lives were shortened just by Krishna's glance. Krishna's glance is very powerful. One, two paragraphs and we're done for this evening. In the Bhagavad Gita, one point twenty one through 25, Arjuna ordered the infallible Lord Sri Krishna to place his chariot between the phalanxes of the soldiers. He asked him to stay there until he had finished observing the enemies he had to face in the battle. When the Lord was so asked, he at once did so, just like an order carrier. And the Lord pointed out all the important men on the opposite side, saying, here is Bhishma, here is Drona, and so on. The Lord, being the supreme living being, is never the order supplier, or the order carrier of anyone, whoever he may be. But out of his causeless mercy and affection for his pure devotees, sometimes he carries out the order of the devotee like an awaiting servant. By executing the order of a devotee, the Lord becomes pleased. As a father is very pleased to carry out the order of a small child. This is possible only out of pure Transcendental love between the Lord and his devotees, and Bhishma Dev was quite aware of this fact. He therefore addressed the Lord as the friend of Arjuna, Vijaya Sake. Paragraph. The Lord diminished the duration of the life of the opposite party by his merciful glance. It is said that all the fighters who had assembled on the battle of Kurukshetra attained salvation by personally seeing the Lord at the time of death. Therefore, he, his diminishing the duration of life of Arjuna's enemy does not mean that he was partial to the cause of Arjuna. Factly, he was merciful to the opposite party because they would not have attained salvation by dying at home or in the ordinary course of life. Here was a chance to see the Lord at the time of death and thus attain salvation from material life. Therefore, the Lord is all good, and whatever he does is for everyone's good. Apparently, it was for the victory of Arjuna, his intimate friend, but factually it was for the good of Arjuna's enemies. Such are the transcendental activities of the Lord, and whoever understands this gets salvation after quitting this material body. That's the verse again. Janma karma shime divyam verse. The Lord does no wrong in any circumstance because he is absolute, all good at all times. So have, um, another two evenings, we get to read more of the meditation of Grandfather Bhishma as Krishna is on the chariot of Arjuna, driving the chariot, taking his arrows, blood coming out of his body, his upper garment, because when, when Krishna was running, 
with the chariot wheel raised in his hand, not as Sudarshan Chakra, the chariot wheel of Arjun, broken, ready to smash Grandfather Bhishma with his upper garment strewing out in the back as he was running so fast, and the beads of perspiration coming down his hair, down his forehead, and his hair ashen from the hooves of the horses. What a sight. And that's what he wanted to think of at the time of death. Imagine. <laughs> Dasya Rasa, right? Enhanced, nourished by the chivalrous Rasa. Because he, he, his whole life was service to Krishna. His whole life was service to Krishna. And this is like the pinnacle of happiness for him in his life of service to Krishna. Amazing. I find it really amazing. Grandfather Bhishma is a special person. We find, for example, repeated in the Krishna's activities with his cowherd friends. Now, Bhishma was in Dasya, but the cowherd boys were Sakya. And the, the cowherd boys, they would regularly play games and Krishna would regularly get defeated. One of the celebrated cowherd boys that would regularly defeat Krishna was Radharani's brother, Sridham. You know Radharani had a brother, right? Radharani had a brother, Sridham. And he would always win, and Krishna would lose. And he would say, what kind of a big man are you? At that same Krishna, just one, he killed Kamsa. You know, a terror. 